Okay. So today we are going to be do, uh, reviewing the works, the work from Sprint uh, 78 and 79. And um, there actually have been a couple of changes to the team uh, focus for a couple of teams. Um, so we have some teams picking up work outside of the area that they have been working um, so that we can get some new features started and um, so that we can unblock other features. So as you can see, um, for example, Concord is now going to be focused on metadata record export. This is a, an important feature that just wasn't getting the attention um, that it needed. And now it has a team that's dedicated solely to um, export. And we hope um, that um, with that and Magda as the PO that we'll be able to make um, some good progress on that. Um, and then Vega is also helping out in a new area. So um, Holly is responsible for the fee fine features and um, these have typically been assigned to UNAM for development, um, but due to changes in staffing on their end, we needed to look um, for support from other teams. And so Vega has been helping out a lot in this area as well. Um, I did scan the team slides for um, newcomers, and um, I believe there was just one. He's on the core functional team. Kevin Day will be joining as one of the rotating uh, Texas A&M developers. Um, so we're excited to have him on the team. Welcome, Kevin. There's also been some shifts, um, some developers moving from one team to another, um, but, but not completely new to the Folio project. So I'm not going to list all of those. And that was it for new people, as far as I could tell. So I'm just going to cruise through these slides and hand it over to Jakob. Yes. All right. Jakob, are you on? Yep, I am. Thanks, Kate. Uh, I'll just give a very quick update about the Edelweiss, uh, aka Folio Q4 2019 release. Um, the release has been finalized and made available on January the 10th, uh, 2020, so last Friday. Uh, this is delayed from the originally uh, planned release date, uh, which you recall that was the 23rd of December. Um, the decision to delay had to be made because there were some outstanding bugs uh, discovered during the bug fest uh, uh, testing. Uh, those bugs were addressed over, over Christmas and then New Year's. Uh, uh, which allowed to make the, the release public on, on the 10th, as I mentioned. Um, Edelweiss GitHub branch, as usual, is tagged in GitHub. So if you want to uh, get uh, the Edelweiss deployed on your own, that's the place to go. Uh, there's also a reference environment set up um, uh, where you can, uh, can see the modules in action. And there, there are manual installation instructions available uh, for Edelweiss, both for the <clears throat> single server deployment and Kubernetes deployment. So follow those links if you're interested in setting it up. Um, yep. Yep. Thanks, Kate. And uh, a note about hotfix releases. So similar to what we have done uh, for the pre previous uh, releases, will uh, in some cases make hotfix module releases available uh, throughout Q1. Uh, 2020 uh, that addressed some issues in, in, in Q4 2019. Those will be uh, triaged by the by the, the, the POs and, and the triage team and uh, and labeled in Jira as Q4 2019 hotfix. Um, hopefully there won't be any, uh, but just in case, uh, I'm mentioning that. And we will have um, uh, a backport releases available for those hotfixes, but module releases available. And a quick reminder that uh, uh, if you're responsible for fixing some of those tickets, some of those issues in, in, in Jira and preparing the release, make sure that the fixed version field is set and it's updated to the appropriate backported release. Otherwise, it's really hard to track what's been, uh, what's been shipped and when. So this is really extremely important to make sure that the fixed version field in Jira is always maintained. Uh, yep, thank you. Can we move on to the next one? Oh, so and that's it for, uh, for release updates. Uh, 
So I think we'll probably skipping the spin highlights. Yep. Please. Unless there's okay. something you want to cool. say. Okay. No, I'm good. Thank you. So I just, just I'll just use this opportunity to thank every everyone who um, uh, who made this release possible, uh, and, and it's been tight, and the schedule is tight, and there was a lot of issues discovered, but they were all fixed. And uh, thanks for the great work. Thank you. That's all I have. Great. Thank you, Jakob. And yes, thank you, everyone, for all the, the support with the release. Okay, so we have sprint highlight slides um, for each of the teams. <clears throat> Can you hear? With a, yeah. Yeah. Hello? I think maybe we just need to mute. Let's see here. I'm going to mute all. And if you have something to say, just unmute yourselves. Okay, all right, so um, yes, each team has a slide for their highlights for the past couple of sprints. Um, but as usual, we're gonna skip over these because much of this will be covered in the demos. Uh, let's see here. And here's the demo slide. Um, the first one I'm excited about, Michelle Cernofsky from Lehigh has been working on NSIP for a while. Um, it's an epic and she's actually done now. She's closed the epic. Um, so that doesn't happen very often. And um, she's going to tell us a little bit about what she developed. Are you ready, Michelle? I'm ready. OK, Just so let me stop sharing. And then you should be able to share. Are you finding the share yeah. option? Yeah. Ah, there we go. Okay. You can see it? Yep. Great. Okay. So before I start the demo, I just want to mention a couple things about the NSIP module. Um, the first thing is it's a um, it's it has a companion edge module. So um, Typically, the NSIP module will be called by an external software. Um, so the edge module is built using the Okapi edge project, um, meaning you can configure an API key for your software vendor to use when you make um, when they make requests to the API, um, which is how I'll be making requests during this demo. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is this initial version of the NSIP module supports four services, and that's accept item checkout item, check-in item, and lookup user. Um, but the module was built using these extensive catalogs on NSIP Toolkit, an open source project. And this means that it'll be fairly easy to build additional services onto the project. Um, for, the, for the most part, building additional services will involve just writing code that interacts with Folio and kind of all the plumbing and um, the classes and the messages for all of the NSIP services are built into the toolkit. Um, and I'll start the demo. Um, so as I mentioned, the NSIP module is usually called by external software by sending XML messages um, into the API. So part of the demo is looking at the XML messages and sending them to the service and looking at the response. And then we can also look at um, what's happening inside of Folio when those services are called. So the first service I'm going to um, demo is the accept item service. And this is called when an item arrives at your library that one of your patrons had requested. So in, in general, it requests the temporary record and it places a hold on it. So you can see this is the um, request XML that gets sent in to the NSIP accept item service. So if I click send. And you can see here is the response XML that gets sent back to the vendor. And then if I jump into Folio, um, we can look at the, it creates an instance, a holdings, and an item. They are all shadowed. So you can see um, suppressed from discovery. It also puts a hold of type page on the item. Um, and we can look at the request. Also, there it is. You can see that it's open. Um, so I will now call the service that actually checks out 
this item. So here's the checkout item XML and we'll paste the item ID in. And the response XML. And if we jump into uh, You can see now that it's checked checked out, and we could go back into the requests and see that um, since it was checked out, the request is now closed. And now I'll check it in. And you can see now it's available. So it's that whole cycle of creating it, checking it out, checking it back in. And the last service is lookup user. And the purpose of this is really to let the vendor know whether or not your patron can borrow or not. Um, so here's the request XML. And it optionally returns information about your patron. And I think this is the this is the major purpose of the service, just to let um, your vendor know that they're okay to borrow. So that's all I have. Um, I just wanted to mention, I'm happy to answer questions about this. I kind of worked on it alone. So here's my email address. If, if you want to talk or um, ping me on Slack, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Also in the GitHub repository, there is some documentation on configuring it. Um, the accept item service creates items and instances and holdings. So um, all of those types have to be configured, but I tried to um, do my best to document it here and I'm open to feedback or questions. That's all I have. Thanks, Michelle. Um, could you say just a little bit about the sort of the, the use case? So how is this, how is NSIP actually used like at yeah. Lehigh or elsewhere? We, we use it for um, interlibrary loan. Mm -hmm. um, so if, um, for example, if someone goes into our catalog and um, we don't have an item that they're looking for or we have a copy and it's checked out, um, they can just hop over to, um, we use uh, the Relay DDD software. They can just hop into that software and request that item. And all of that interaction, like looking up the patron, calls the lookup user service. Um, the patron is using our vendor software that make to make the request, but when the item gets shipped here and it's physically here, um, their software calls the accept item service, which creates that temporary record in our um, system so that it can be circulated. Does that help? Got it. Yeah, that helps a lot. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. Sure. Thanks. All right. Great. Thanks so much, Michelle. Um, I think we had Thunderjet next. Yep. Uh, Looks like Nikita kicking off. Uh, yes, hello. Hi. Uh, let me share my screen. And uh, let me know if you see it. It's good. Uh, okay, uh, cool. So today I'd like to um, show values uh, we added for fiscal years uh, and Previously, we had uh, only zeros for allocated and available and available. And uh, now we have money here. And uh, you can just uh, uh, note that uh, the first um, like number is three uh, for allocated and available. Plus, uh, we display uh, ledgers and uh, groups with their totals uh, on the screen. And uh, let me show how we, uh, how this value can be updated. Uh, so let's go to funds uh, list. And uh, let me create a new budget uh, to allocate some money. Uh, and uh, on this form, uh, we pre-select, now, now we pre-select uh, current fiscal year by default. And uh, let's at uh, 10,000. And uh, go back to fiscal year. 
And uh, now you can see that uh, total uh, total va values uh, have been updated, and now uh, the first number is four uh, in both columns. Uh, we just added uh, ten thousand um, dollars, and that's it from my side. Do you have any questions? Uh, okay, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next from Thunderjet. Andre? Yes. Yeah. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, I can start. Today I'm going to present the main updates in organizations and order apps. Uh, to see changes, uh, let's go to organization first. Mm, from the list, we can uh, select uh, one of them to see changes. Uh, here we can see organization details and uh, pay attention on the contact information accordion. If we click uh, on it, we can see the list of categories. So uh, now all uh, contact information um, is grouped by uh, categories. So we can see customer service, customer service. And uh, here we can see, so um, if uh, we try to edit, uh, let's uh, remove categories. And for one, we can change and save. Uh, here we can see changes. So now we can see only two accordions. It's uh, returns category and uh, uncategorized uh, all other information. Uh, the next uh, updates in organization is uh, contact people. Now we have uh, the list of contacts that uh, are associated with the uh, organization with the main information and with primary emails, phone. And uh, if um, a user clicks on one of them, he will see details previously. It uh, was possible only from edit screen, but now it's possible to see details from uh, two screens. Uh, the next uh, part of the presentation is about uh, receiving and checking process. It's uh, from orders. Let's find prepared order. Mm, the functionality is added uh, for checking and uh, for receiving, but uh, we'll see on one of them, it's uh, checking. So uh, to check an item, let's uh, add piece. So we need to select caption, expected receipt date and location, and uh, we need to add item. Here we can see, fill barcode and call number and other required fields. Okay, so we can save it. So now if we check it and no, it's not this this one. So if we click checking, we can see checking details, and uh, we see the barcode and call number information were retrieved uh, from inventory, and we can change it and check it in. Here we can see uh, main information about uh, uh, item and uh, piece status and the date uh, where piece was received. If we removed it and try to do 
is the same. We see that uh, barcode, the call number information were updated as uh, we updated it previously. Um, I think uh, that's all I have for now. If you have any question, feel free to ask. I have a question about the categories. It went kind of quickly, but they looked a little bit like tags. Are they similar to tags? The, the category is basically a controlled vocabulary in uh, the organization settings. Uh -huh. um, so I guess, yeah, they, they do op operate sort of similar to tags, but they're local to the organization app. And okay. they're really only used for contact info. Yeah, phone numbers, emails, and both for information directly related to the organization and also mm -hmm. information for the people themselves, right? And was it that if you create a category of returns then there's like an accordion created for it and the things so go into that accordion? It's, it's only if you've tagged some information with that category. That's Basically cool. when they render it on the front end, they render the categories that are being used under that accordion. It's pretty um, cool. But those categories, yeah, categories can be used for all the organizations. Like it's a global list for all the organizations kind of thing. Nice. Within a, within a tenant. So like Dennis said, custom to the tenant. And you can see up on the top right, there's tags for at the organization level, not at the contact level um, that can be added to organizations that are completely separate from the categories. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay, so next up is Vega with Alexander. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Okay then. Um, tell me when you see it. We see it. Okay, great. So today I want to show you a few features that Tim Vega has been working on in the last few weeks. Uh, namely, big sleep reports. Um, I'm hearing myself. Someone echoing. I'll try to okay. mute people. Okay, thanks. Um, barcode images and patron notices and multiple items and check-in notices. So I'd suggest we start with big slips. So big slip is one of the stuff slips. Here's the template I have prepared for this demo. Um, this is an example of what a big slip might look like. Um, and actually this template uh, showcases all the tokens that are currently supported for a big slip. So what a big slip report is, it's a report that contains information about all the requests um, for uh, for, for, for all the page requests in status open, not yet filled. For um, service point that matches the service point currently selected in folio by folio operator. Yeah, it's a mouthful, I know, but uh, I hope it makes sense. So the way you create a Pixlip report is you click this button to view this drop down, and as you can see here is the button which is currently inactive. Uh, it's inactive because currently there are no uh, requests uh, for this service point that qualify as a big slip request. Um, in order to create uh, this report, we need to create a few requests. So we, here we have a few items. Let's create requests for them new and I have a couple of test users here you can see it's a page request okay another one So that makes it two. Now let's create a couple more for another user. Uh, 
Okay. And another one. So we now have created four requests, four page requests um, for items. All of them are um, have effective location that matches uh, the location currently selected in Folio. So now we can create a Pixlip report. Let's try and do that. This is the dialog window. I'm just going to print it into PDF. And let's see what we got. And there you go, we have four pages with a big slip on each one of them. And if I change the service point right here, you can see that uh, this button uh, becomes inactive because there are no requests for items uh, with effective location uh, matching CERC desk to. And that's it for big slip reports. I suggest we move on to multiple items and check in. Let me just cancel all these requests. That's really nifty. Right. Uh, any other questions, comments, maybe? Nope. Okay, good. I agree. It's really nifty. And I wonder if maybe we can leverage some of that to create a like a CSV export. Um, for the page request pick, pick list um, because sure. that's a, another feature we have in the backlog. Excuse me. So um, actually I'm thinking I will combine next to demos in one flow. Um, yeah, let's move on. Um, so next feature I want to show is multiple items and check-in uh, notices. So for this demo, I have prepared a, a template. You can see it here. Uh, this template contains information about a user and uh, loans that have been checked in for this user. And uh, if today's my lucky day, we will see multiple loans for in, in each email we receive. So I also have a patron notice policy that leverages this uh, template I just showed you. Uh, it shoots an email every time uh, an item is checked in. And we have circulation rules set up to make use of this policy. Um, and again, we have two test users. We will check out some items for both of them and then we will ch check them back in. So let's try and do that. Um, Okay, let's do that. So I will check out two items for the first user. And uh, the way it used to work when uh, um, the Foley operator uh, scans or inputs a barcode in this field and hits enter, uh, an email not notification was um, sent immediately to the patron. So it means that if 10 items were checked in, the user will, uh, would receive 10 consecutive emails. The way it works now is those notices are being accumulated uh, while uh, the session is still active. And once the operator hits end session, those notices um, are combined uh, by the user and the user receives an email with a list of um, items uh, that were checked in for him. So right now let's hit end session and check out some items for another user. And this one. And sessions. So now we have four items checked out for two different users, and each one of those users um, 
have an email inbox uh, mailbox set up as you can see both mailboxes are currently empty so we should receive a notification email once we check those items back in let's do just that so let's check in this one and this one This one. And this one. Yeah, so that makes it four. And let's end the session. So now we should receive two notification emails. Yeah, as you can see, first user received an email with um, two loans. That's one ah, you can see uh, with two loans and second user also received a notification with two loans in them. And um, as you can see, we have uh, barcode images in these emails and we didn't have them before. <laughs> so uh, we have barcode images for both user barcode and uh, item barcode. And we have two representations of barcode as numbers and as image. And that is it. That covers all three features that we have developed. Thank you. Any questions? No questions for me, but it looks like some really great functionality. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Concord is next with Yeveni. Yeah, hello everyone. I would like to share my screen. Uh, do you see it? Yep. Uh, so let's start. Uh, as you can see, there there is an item with uh, added information about the call number prefix, call number, and call number suffix. Uh, so now, if I uh, check check in this item, as the application uh, will show uh, the values of the mentioned fields separated by space. And also we renamed uh, the call number field to the effective call number uh, string. The next feature is about the last scanned date display. So now even if I back, even if I try to backdate uh, the check-in process and uh, check-in uh, item, the user uh, will be able uh, to see the information about the last scanned uh, date in the item details. So uh, as far as, uh, as you remember, uh, I backdated uh, the check-in process and uh, here is the current date and uh, time. Let's move uh, to the open loans uh, lists. The new action uh, declared declare lost uh, was added to the drop down, and uh, if I uh, click the button, uh, the new dialog will appear uh, to add the new information. So let's uh, add some uh, information to uh, enable confirm button and uh, press on it. Oh, it, it looks like someone uh, closed uh, this, uh, check, check it in this item, sorry. Uh, I will try the next one. Uh, as you can see, uh, the item was declared uh, lost and uh, the action was uh, disappeared from the action menu. Also, the item uh, can be declared lost from the item details page and uh, the button is disabled because item status is declared lost and there are uh, information about lost date and uh, 
the action, the last action uh, in the actions history list. Uh, thanks. Uh, this, this is all from my side. Nice. Thank you, Yvonne. Lots of good stuff there. Okay. Um, next team is uh, Stripes Force with Ryan Berger. Hey. Hello. All right. So I'm going to demonstrate a change that uh, myself and John Colburn have made to the result list to fix some performance issues that we um, that have been reported in various environments. All right. Well, I need to reset just to, to share. So I'm gonna hop off just a second. Okay. Maybe while we're waiting for Ryan, we can just go to the next team and come back. Let me see who is next. Um, oh, Core Functional with Michal. Um, why don't we do that? Before you start, Michal, I just wanted to mention, because I think you have just a few things to demo. Um, the focus for Core Functional um, the past couple of sprints was really uh, on the release. So we fixed 29 plus bugs. Um, and did countless releases and bug fix releases. So a lot of attention went to the release, but we got a few things, a, a few new features done as well. So over to you, Michal, and then we'll, we'll hand it over to, to Ryan. Sounds good, thanks, thanks Kate. Um, let me just uh, open my screen here. You know, I might have the same issue as Ryan for some reason, let me. Oh, really? <laughs> That's weird. Yeah. What's going on? I just, I had to uh, reinstall Zoom recently and I'm not sure if, uh, let me just try something. Yeah, yep. uh, and I'm back now if, if you want to take care of that, Michal. Yeah, I might, uh, I might have to. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, uh, I, I suspect you're on a Mac too. Yep. Exactly, yep. So. Yep, <laughs> yep. It forces you to close Zoom yes. in order to allow share permissions. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let me, right. I, I hope to come back soon. <laughs> so, all right, okay. all right, so that's all you, Ryan. All right, uh, okay. So let me just, okay, have this now. All right, um, so the issue that John and I were uh, solving was um, for long result lists, there uh, was a performance issue that would cause um, the UI to, to freeze up um, uh, because of the large volume of uh, network requests that the um, the result list would would um, would cause uh, because of the infinite scroll. So we introduced a new type of functionality that would allow um, paging as you scroll. Um, and behind the scenes, we also reduced the number of network requests that occur. Um, so it's a, a faster experience for users, but it's also, um, it, it doesn't, it, it puts them, it doesn't put them in a situation where they can uh, cause the UI to, to freeze. Um, so I'll show the, the new behavior and um, then I'll uh, compare it to what was uh, there before. So um, if I just search for Europe, um, we, so we set the page size um, to 100, and we've uh, done this just for inventory um, so far. Uh, other modules can opt in uh, very easily. So when you scroll to the bottom before, it would um, auto load more results, but now you have a load more button, and you just push that, and then you get more results. And 
So we can just do that a few times um, since we only we have 246 uh, records for this result set. Uh, another small change that I made was um, if you sort, um, it resets uh, the pages. Um, before it would just reload all the pages you had previously loaded. And um, in talking to uh, Vince and others, uh, it, it's not a behavior that makes sense, but it's also it's expensive if you've loaded a lot of pages. Um, so then you would just reload any any pages. Um, and uh, so that, yeah, that applies to any sort that's going to reset the paging. Um, so yeah, so if I compare that to what was there before, um, if I go into the codex, uh, that one still has um, uh, All right, so this is a large set. So if I just kind of drag the scroll bar down partway through, um, it's just going to spend a really long time thinking, loading, um, and it's just the UI is just going to sit there. So effectively, the user can very easily just create a broken experience for themselves and that's what we wanted to avoid by introducing the show more button. Um, the user is able to just page the results and they can't position themselves to just <laughs> be looking at these blank squares that are just gonna sit here forever. Um, they may or may not eventually resolve. Um, since there's so many requests queued up, it can just get stuck. The other thing I'll mention is the show more button does also offer some accessibility benefit. Uh, when you click it, um, the reader will um, be focused on the first result of the next uh, page. So it's a nice little bonus that we get with that uh, feature change. Um, so that's that's all I have for this. Uh, any Any questions, just let me know. Thanks, Ryan. This looks Welcome. like a huge improvement. Thank you. I like it. All right. Did we get Michal back? I'm back here. Let me, let me see if this, this works this time. Um, sounds like, yeah, let's see. Um, all right. Can you, can you see my screen this time? Yep. Oh, sorry about that. So as, as Kate mentioned, this, this will be very short, just a couple of small changes. Um, the, the first one is um, related to uh, new permissions um, under request app related to re reordering queue. So as you can see, I'm currently logged in as user, which only has um, reordering queue um, permission on together with view requests. Um, permission and uh, I'm able to, to get to the requests app and the only option I can see here is the reordering queue uh, option here. Uh, it looks like I don't see any items here, but uh, previously we would we would see more, more uh, options here with uh, a bigger permission set available for that user. Um, the second little change uh, we introduced here is under inventory app and we are continuing with adding new uh, filters under uh, different segments here and the, the two new filters we introduced recently is um, are the resource type um, filter and also the format filter and those those filters work in a similar fashion to to other uh, filters we added before so you're able now to uh, search by um, resource type or um, or the format here just try to find something you can see that we get the results back. Um, and then the last tiny change here is um, on the item view under inventory, we added this effective call number, which which, which was missing before. And I believe uh, the same is available under edit screen also for items. Uh, so that's that's new and that's that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Michal. And if anybody's wondering what that effective call number is, it's um, the call number that that 
inherits from the holding. So if there's uh, call number data populated at the holding and nothing at the item, then it, it displays the holding data. And if it's something populated at the item, it displays the item data. And that's all saved on the item record. All right, um, cool. So then the next is, uh, oh, um, okay, so now we're on to the QA update for Anton. Do you wanna share your screen, Anton, or do you want me to share the slides? Are you on, Anton? You're muted. Yes, um, hi. Yes, hi. if you could please just uh, share the slides because I'm having the same problem as you. <laughs> okay, um, all right. Let's yep. put it in presentation mode. All right, here you yep. go. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, as usual, starting with, with coverage, everybody uh, was busy with the um, uh, with release, so there's not a lot of progress there, except we ran into the nasty uh, bug when uh, 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 bug, uh, big test, uh, tests are failing for inventory and we need to prioritize this defect to fix it before it spreads into other, other modules. Other than that, coverage pretty much stays, uh, stayed the same as um, um, we had during previous sprint review. Uh, could jump to the next slide, please. Has inventory coverage always been zero or is that no, part of this bug? It, it, no, it's part of this bug because we disabled it so that we can uh, get through the PI reviews. I see, okay. Uh, so, but it was pretty, no, it was, uh, it was high, but right now it's just disabled and we need to fix this bug so that, ah. uh, because if it starts spreading to other modules, then kind of, we don't have a gauge meter. Yeah, that's a problem. Okay, yeah. all right, thanks for the explanation. Yeah. Uh, bug trend, uh, as you can see in, on the right-hand side, we went to sleep, on the holidays, so nobody was fixing and nobody was creating. And then starting the new year, we, we got back to our uh, fixing and creating mode. But that being said, uh, we have a kind of new directive to all the teams to spend 40% of their time on, uh, uh, on uh, of the 40% uh, of the sprint uh, on the bug fixing for all P1s, P2s, and P3s should be prioritized. 40% uh, of available of the, uh, available story points. So when you plan your sprint, guys, please uh, um, please take note of that and plan accordingly. Okay, next slide. So now I just um, I didn't have a chance to share what was happening during latest bug fest. I think you all felt the impact because you had to fix bugs. But I just want to share what happened during that process in the middle of December. So uh, we added more members to uh, uh, testing community. So it went up from 64 to 94 and it was, I didn't, uh, advertise on social media or anywhere. It's just by the word of mouth. Uh, people ask to join, and they, um, and we added them to the to the list. And more institutions join because I think they have an interest in going live or planning to go live. So the logos of the institutions that you see on this slide, those are new new ones who join. So next slide. So during the last quarter, we also did a lot of work with product owners and testers, but um, we were creating test case descriptions. And uh, during that time, we created um, uh, over, 400, uh, over 400 test descriptions. And before it was just a summary, now we have about 700 test cases and more than 400 has test case descriptions. So anything that has yellow and green color, 
uh, already has content and it can be given to anyone in the testing community and they should be able to conduct the test. So it's much easier to spread uh, the load compared to the previous bug test when you really need to know the system before uh, just so that you can figure out what to do just by uh, test case summary. So in that effort kind of paid off. Uh, yes, that was a good move, Kate. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so you can see the bug fest Q4 on the left hand side and bug fest uh, uh, 3.2, which was in September on the right hand side. And you can see that we executed almost 700 test cases versus 600 and we didn't leave anything on the table. It is a pass or fail and very few test cases that were left blocked or un, uh, untested. So uh, we failed 67 uh, test cases and I think it was, uh, we created more than 70, uh, 70 bugs total. So could you please uh, move, move to the next slide. So this is comparison what happened during bug fest 3.2 and uh, 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 bug fest Q4 can see that we, uh, we testers found like almost 30 more defects during Q4 and they found um, uh, a lot more uh, P2 defects and uh, most of them, the, everything just but two has been fixed. So, and that's reflected in the big effort and delay of Q4 release because we realized that we have so many defects found that we don't have enough time to hit the deadline. So we decided to delay and the punch list consisted of over, um, I think 70 defects that were fixed and verified in the bug, bug fest environment. Um, next slide. So this is the list of testers by name who contributed. So there were some testers that did a lot of work and some testers that did a few, uh, but most, all of people on, uh, on, in the left columns that has community header, this is all volunteers. And on the right hand side, folio staff, this is all product owners and yours truly. And the trend that I like is that we are taking a lot more work out of the product owners and community takes a lot more work. So community executed 150 test cases more uh, uh, this uh, bug fest compared to September and fewer test cases had to be done by folio staff. So that's a, that's a good trend that we're looking to continue and bring it down to zero. So all the test cases will be done by community. That's awesome. Uh, so that's, that's a good trend. Uh, this is uh, just list of uh, libraries that were participating. So we got a lot more uh, libraries um, in, uh, in Q4 and a lot of them were from Germany. So, uh, big participation from five colleges and big participation from uh, German libraries. I think because they also planning to go live at some, at some point, but they were very active in, in this, test, uh, in this uh, test cycle. Nice. And I think that's my last slide. Yes, so thank you very much. Anton. Thank you, Anton. Um, if I can just jump in, we're not running um, UI inventory tests in the continuous integration environment, as you mentioned, um, so we didn't get coverage statistics. Um, for what it's worth, those tests usually run locally and coverage on that module is around 65%. It's not zero. <laughs> it's, no, it's not. Yes, it's not zero. We were making good progress there. Uh, it just uh, theory of broken windows. We need yep. to keep, yes. keep everything clean and tidy, and then it creates the environment for yep. other modules that coming in that they need to match the level. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks, Zach. Um, all right. So, 
Uh, next up, we'll have just two regular two week sprints, although um, a lot of people will be out, probably not too many developers, but WolfCon is coming up, as most people know. Um, and then we do have slides for each of the teams with high level plans for the coming sprints, which you can look at if you're interested. And then finally, I just wanted to remind everyone that we are recruiting for a bilingual Mandarin English product owner position. Um, this is to work uh, with a um, Folio development team based in Shanghai that is adapting Folio to the Chinese public um, library market. It's a big team and a really cool opportunity. It's a paid position, um, one to two year contract. So if you or anyone you know is interested, um, take a look at the, um, the full uh, job description on the product owners page and reach out because they are eager to get someone hired soon. Anything else before we wrap the call? All right, I guess we're done a little early this time. Thank you, everyone. Um, we will share the deck and uh, uh, recording soon. Thanks much.